Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Thursday, January 5th, 2023. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today. The U.S. is against uh, countries normalizing with Assad, the Syrian president. So the State Department said this on Tuesday that the U.S. opposes other countries normalizing with the Syrian government of President Bashar al-Assad following high-level talks between Syria and Turkey. So the defense ministers of Syria and Turkey, they met in Moscow at the end of December, marking the first time that Ankara and Damascus held talks at that level since 2011. Um, So sources told Middle East Eye that there were no deals made at the meeting. Mostly Turkish sources said that. That came after there were some reports that said Turkey agreed to withdraw its troops from Syria. But but it doesn't seem like any deal like that was made. Um, Although something like that could happen in the future, they could be moving in that direction because Turkey's foreign minister said that he expects to meet with his Syrian and Russian counterparts later this month. So Russia is hosting these talks. The the talks in Moscow also included Russia's defense minister and Russia's foreign minister is going to participate in the next one. So this Turkish rapprochement with Syria, it's a significant shift. It's a pretty big deal as Turkey severed relations with Damascus in, in 2012 and supported the failed regime change effort against Assad, backing all sorts of anti-government fighters inside Syria. And even though It's clear now that Assad isn't going anywhere and and countries are recognizing that in the region. The U.S. is against Syria's neighbors normalizing with his government. So this is State Department spokesman Ned Price. He said, quote, we do not support countries upgrading their relations or expressing support to rehabilitate the brutal dictator Bashar al-Assad, end quote. So then he was asked specifically if the U.S. spoke to Turkey about the issue And based on his answer, it sounds like they did. He said, quote, we've made very clear to all of our allies and partners that now is not the time to normalize relations. Now is not the time to upgrade relations, end quote. So, uh, you know, when it comes to Turkey, they're not one, especially Erdogan, to, you know, listen to the dictates of the U.S. So I I don't know if the U.S. position is going to (laughs) have... much impact on their plans here. I do know they've they've faced a lot of... uh, opposition to this policy from Syrian, what they call Syrian opposition. Uh, you know, there's a ton of refu- Syrian refugees in Turkey, a lot of people that are against the Assad government, so they're facing a lot of backlash. But I still think that they're going to go ahead and take some steps toward normalization. Um, so the current U.S. policy, and this is according to Secretary of State Antony Blinken when it comes to Syria, is to oppose the country's reconstruction. Uh, that's a very cruel policy uh, that just hurts ordinary Syrians. Um, So Price, of course, accused Assad of continuing to inflict atrocities on the Syrian people, but U.S. policies against Syria have a pretty devastating impact on Syrian civilians. And this was recently detailed by Elena Duhan, who is a U.N. special rapporteur. Uh, Her title is she's a rapporteur on unilateral coercive measures, which are sanctions, and she detailed how they're harming ordinary Syrians, saying that they had catastrophic effects on Syrians of all walks of life, including by causing medicine shortages, and she called for them to be lifted pretty strongly. Uh, But, you know, the U.S. ignores her, of course. And on top of the sanctions, the U.S. maintains an occupation force in eastern Syria of about 1,000 troops and backs the Kurdish-led SDF in the region. And this allows the U.S. to control a pretty significant portion of Syrian territory, uh, about one third, they say. Uh, And if you look at a map, that's what it looks like. One third of the country is controlled by the U.S. uh, You know, of course, this is against the will of the Syrian government. Um, And there's no end to this American siege in sight. Uh, As the White House said in October, that it has no plans to lift sanctions or end its military presence in the country. And we still see it resisting. Uh, other countries normalizing. Uh, the next one here, another uh, Syria one, uh, rockets hit a base in eastern Syria housing U.S. troops. 
So Central Command said this on Wednesday that two rockets were fired at a base in eastern Syria earlier in the day uh, that was housing U.S. troops. They reported that there were no casualties in the incident. So the attack took place at a base called the Mission Support Site uh, Conoco, Conoco, which is a U.S. base to the next to the gas fields, the Conoco gas fields in eastern Syria's Deir Azor province. So as part of its occupation of Syria, the U.S. and its Kurdish allies control most of the country's oil and gas resources. So, you know, this is when Trump, if you remember back in 2019, he said he was going to leave Syria and everybody freaked out. I mean, everybody uh, in Congress, at least, uh, lost it. And then, you know, on the on the TV, <laughs> like it was the biggest deal in the world. Uh, and he reversed the decision. You know, he caved to the pressure. And when he did, he said, oh, we're going to stay there to secure the oil. We're going to stay there to take the oil. Um, so that is very much part of what they're doing. And I think really it's more about depriving Syria of this resource uh, than, you know, profiting off of the the oil. Although I believe there was some deal signed between um, the Kurdish SDF and uh, an American oil company. Um, so CENTCOM said that the SDF found the site where these rockets were fired from, and they found a third that was unfired. And the comment, they did not attribute blame for the attack. You know, the U.S., um, there's a few forces in Syria that that would have an interest in attacking the U.S. You know, ISIS, uh, the Shia militias that are that operate there that are mostly Iraqi um, groups like that. Uh, but we don't know. Uh, U.S. bases in Syria, they frequently come under fire and there's rarely casualties in the in the latest rocket attacks. But, you know, this presence, it always risks sparking a wider war. There's currently about 1,000 U.S. troops stationed in the country nominally to fight ISIS, and they have been fighting ISIS, as I went over recently. CENTCOM said they killed 400-something ISIS, suspected ISIS members, I should say. It's not like they're giving these people trials. They're just killing them um, in Syria, and and most of that was from a, uh, a uh, big battle that happened in the beginning of 2021 between the SDF and ISIS. It was like an attempted prison break. But anyway, so they are fighting... ISIS to some extent, but it's really this presence is about the putting the pressure on Syria and Damascus. If the U.S. got out of the way, you know, you have the Syrian government and the SDF, they could work together to fight ISIS. The SDF says that every time the U.S. threatens to leave, that they could uh, have a rapprochement with Damascus. Um, that's another big thing. You know, if the U.S. got out of the way and left Syria, it would probably speed up Turkey and Syria's normalization, Turkey pulling its troops out. Syria deploying its Arab troops on the border with Turkey to make them happy. You know, the U.S. is just an impediment to that. Uh, besides risking sparking a bigger war, it's just they're just in the way of, you know, these f factions uh, working things out. Uh, all right. So the next one here, getting into Taiwan, the U.S. is sending a delegation to Taiwan for trade talks in a move that is sure to anger China. So the office of the U.S. trade representative said this on Wednesday that a U.S. delegation is heading to Taipei. The U.S. and Taiwan agreed to formal trade talks last year, and the first round was held in New York in November. So because Washington and Taiwan, they don't have official relations, these negotiations are being held under the auspice of their respective de facto embassies. But the U.S. delegation is being led by Terry McCartan, and he's the assistant U.S. trade representative for China affairs. So that means, you know, that the U.S. trade representative office is part of the president's executive office. So here we have officials from Biden's executive office going to Taiwan. So this this is going to uh, China is not going to be happy about this. And then the. They're also the meeting is also going to be attended by officials from several other government agencies, other U.S. government agencies. And Taiwan's deputy trade representative is going to be leading the Taiwanese side. So it's, you know, again, under the auspice of these de facto embassies, but it's government officials, uh, high level government officials meeting. And China is against contacts between high level U.S. and Taiwanese government officials as it views such cooperation as the U.S. moving away from the one China policy. Beijing is especially opposed to high-level U.S. officials visiting Taiwan and typically reacts by launching military drills around the island. 
So the trade talks, they're an effort by the U.S. to reduce economic dependence on China. And overall, the increase in U.S. contacts with Taiwan is part of the Biden administration's strategy to counter China's influence in the region. Um, and they're calling these trade talks the U.S.-Taiwan Initiative on 21st Century Trade and said that they're intended to develop uh, you know, ways to deepen the U.S.-Taiwanese economic and trade relationship. Talks are going to focus on all sorts of different areas, reaching trade agreements, regulatory practices, anti-corruption standards, um, deepening agricultural trade, removing discriminatory barriers to trade, digital trade, uh, and ways to address distortive practice of state-owned enterprises and non-market policies and practices. Speaking of non-market policies and practices, uh, you know, when it comes to Taiwan, a major factor in this, of course, is the fact that Taiwan is the world's largest producer of advanced semiconductors. And the Biden administration is trying to entice Taiwanese companies to open more facilities inside the U.S. And the U.S. is trying to expand domestic semiconductor manufacturing through this CHIPS Act that they passed, which includes about $50 billion in subsidies to subsidize uh, the domestic production of these advanced chips. All right, the next one here. China and the Philippines vow to handle maritime disputes through consultations. So Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., he met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing on Wednesday, and the two leaders agreed to handle maritime disputes in a friendly manner through consultations. So tensions have been high between China and the Philippines in the South China Sea as vessels from the two nations occasionally have standoffs near disputed reefs. China, the Philippines, and several other Southeast Asian countries all have overlapping claims to the water. So if you look at this map that I put in the article here, it shows you China's uh, claims and then all the other countries, and they all overlap. Um, and it's not just China that has pretty big claims here. Vietnam does as well. Um, uh, where was I here? Um, so the U.S. Uh, backs the Philippines in its maritime dispute with China, and it always reminds Beijing that the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty can be invoked in response to attacks on Philippine vessels in the South China Sea. And Marcos's trip to China, it comes not long after Kamala Harris, the vice president, visited the Philippines, and while she was there, she reiterated that the U.S. is willing to go to war for the Philippines in the South China Sea. That's the U.S. policy. And the U.S. is also looking to build new military facilities in the Philippines. And local officials believe that the U.S. might return to Subic Bay. Um, and that was the previous site of what was once the largest U.S. Uh, military base in Asia. But it, it closed 30 years ago. But they might return. Uh, but China, you know, Marcos's visit to China is, is, is seen as crucial to China's effort to stop the Philippines from getting too close to the U.S. So she, I think, is working hard on that. Because um, right now, as things stand, you know, the U.S. wants a new big base in Southeast Asia. And right now, the Philippines is really the only place where that might could possibly happen. Um, and Marcos, he came into office in June 2021. Um, oh, sorry, I, I think I got that wrong. He came in in June 2022. I got to correct that. Um, just recently. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry about that. I just double checking. Yeah. June, 2022, I got to fix that. Uh, but he's expected to take a more balanced approach to the U S and China than his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte. He was, Duterte was more friendly toward China and he actually, although he did, you know, play the U S against China as well. And, but he threatened to scrap a military agreement with the U S um, and said that the U.S. has to pay more if it wants to stay in the Philippines. Um, but during the meeting, she made clear that he views China-Philippine relations as a top priority. He said the two nations should be good neighbors, and they could bring benefits to the people of the two countries if they have a positive uh, you know, relationship. And he also offered for the two nations to cooperate on oil and gas discovery. So uh, this is uh, Marcos Jr. He's in China for a few days. And she also praised his father, Ferdinand Marcos Sr., who was the leader of the Philippines from 1965 to 1986 for 
over two decades. Um, pretty notorious uh, leader. He he ruled, uh, I believe, under martial law for some of that period. Uh, but he did. He opened up relations with China, and that's what she mentioned in their meeting. All right, the next one here. Um, more military buildup in Asia. Japan's Kishida he vows stronger alliance with the U.S. amid his military buildup. So he said this on Wednesday. Uh, this is Japan's Prime Minister Kishida. He vowed to expand Tokyo's alliance with the U.S. under his new controversial military spending plan that breaks from the country's post-World War II pacifism. So Kushida made the comments when previewing an upcoming visit to Washington, D.C., where he will visit, well, he, sorry, <laughs> where he will meet with President Biden on January 13th. Uh, Kushida said, quote, we will show to the rest of the world an even stronger Japan-U.S. alliance which is a linchpin of Japanese security and diplomacy. We will also show our further cooperation toward achieving a free and open Indo-Pacific, end quote. So that term, free and open Indo-Pacific, that's, you know, you, you always hear that from U.S. officials, basically means a region where, you know, the U.S. and its allies are more dominant than China. Um, Kishida's spending plan is going to double Japan's military budget over the next five years. It's a pretty huge deal. Uh, it makes it 2% of the country's GDP, and it would bring, you know, Japan as a huge economy. This would make it its uh, military budget the third largest in the world, right behind China. And this military buildup, of course, has been celebrated by U.S. officials, and it is specifically aimed at China. A new national security strategy released by Kishida's government names China as the biggest strategic challenge. Echoing language uh, in the Pentagon's 2022 National Defense Strategy. So it's very similar. And one of Kishida's most controversial plans is his decision to, pur to purchase hundreds of U.S.-made Tomahawk missiles, which have a range of over 1,000 miles, putting China and North Korea well within reach. Under Japan's U.S.-imposed constitution, because it was U.S. occupation forces, that made them uh, say their their military would only be for self defense. So that's what the constitution says, but that's that's changing. Um, and I quoted Tim Sh Shorak. He is uh, a journalist who specializes in Japan and Korea. Um, but he said, uh, according to this new Japanese national security strategy, it includes language that allows attacks on other countries, not just in Japan's defense but also in situations where the U.S. is under attack. So that's really extending what they consider self-defense. They're also going to include defense of the United States. And he said that this policy, Shorak, uh, he, he said that th these policies, you know, basically make Japan America's new proxy army. Um, and he said that back when Shinzo Abe was the prime minister who he was assassinated last year, but he uh, that was after he was out of office. But he's the one that really got the ball rolling on all of this. So it's something to keep an eye on. All right, the next one, France says that it pledged light tanks to Ukraine. So Emmanuel Macron, the French president, uh, spoke with Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, and he said that Paris is going to provide Kiev with AMX-10 RC armored combat vehicles as Ukraine has been seeking Western-made tanks. A French official said that these AMX-10RC vehicles will be the first time that Western-made armored vehicles are being delivered in support of the Ukrainian army. But these armored vehicles do fall short of the heavier tanks that Zelensky has been asking for, such as U.S.-made Abrams tanks. Um, so the AMX-10RC, which France described as a light tank, it was built in the 1980s, and it's being phased out by the French military. The vehicle is lightweight. It's on six wheels as opposed to the tracks that heavier tanks have. Um, if you're watching, you can see the picture of it here. It's got wheels. Um, but it does have a pretty big gun, a 105-millimeter gun, which is smaller, though, than the, the heavy tanks, but that's still pretty big. Um, and right now, it's not clear how many of these they're going to be sending Ukraine. Um, but Zelensky said in his nightly address on Wednesday that France's pledge shows that there is no rational reason why Kiev hasn't received Western-made tanks. He said, quote, this is what sends a clear signal to all our partners. There is no rational reason why Ukraine has not yet been supplied with Western-type 
tanks, end quote. So also on Wednesday, President Biden said that sending Ukraine Bradley infantry fighting vehicles was also on the table. So these Bradley vehicles, they're armored vehicles designed to transport infantry infantry troops with armored protection that are typically equipped with a 25 uh, millimeter gun. So uh, significantly smaller than what these French light tanks have, uh, but still pretty powerful. But again, it falls short of what Zelensky wants. Um, while that's true, it, it does still, this does also represent a pretty significant escalation of U.S. and other Western military aid for Ukraine. So while Zelensky was in Washington, D.C., according to the New York Times, he was asking for Abrams tanks, but he was denied. And Ukraine has received other tanks from NATO members such as Poland, Soviet-era tanks. You know, they sent over 200 earlier in the war. Um, but I believe, you know, all of those have been sent. I know, although Morocco is transferring them some Soviet tanks, but um, they're asking for a lot more. And Valery Zolushny, who is the head of Ukraine's armed forces, he said in an interview with The Economist back in December, you know, that wasn't too positive about Ukraine's outlooks for the battle. He said Ukraine needs hundreds of tanks to have a chance of pushing Russia out of the territory that it has captured in Feb since February. Uh, so he said that he needs 300 tanks, 600 to 700 infantry fighting vehicles like the Bradleys and 500 howitzers. And then he thinks it's realistic to get to those lines. Um, but that's a lot that he's asking for. And, you know, they're not giving it. So, um, again, I, I don't know if we're going to see these Abrams tanks go to Ukraine in the near future. Who knows? Because they are slowly escalating. You know, everything they said, they, they said they weren't going to give them. The HIMARS systems, and they said they weren't going to give them the Patriot missiles. You know, but they're they're giving them all this stuff. So who knows if if they'll eventually give them the heavier tanks that they want? Um, all right. So the last uh, one in the news section here, uh, an Israeli MP. This is from the Middle East Eye. Says that it's time to subdue Palestinians once and for all in the last war. So this guy uh, is very extreme. Um. But he is a member of the governing coalition. His party is, is part of this coalition. This is who Netanyahu is allied with the former government. So an Israeli MP in the governing coalition has called for a final war against the Palestinians to subdue them once and for all. Following international con condemnation of Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir's incursion into Al-Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem. So Hamas, the Palestinian group that controls Gaza, they threatened retaliation on Tuesday after Ben Gavir mar marched across Al-Aqsa in defiance of long-standing agreements preventing unsanctioned visits by to the site by non-Muslims. So on Wednesday, uh, Zvika Fogel is this guy's name. He's an NP with Ben Gavir's ultra-nationalist Jewish Power Party. He hid out at Hamas saying in an interview on Israel's Channel 12, that Israel's policy of going to war with the Palestinians every two or three years was not enough and that it should subdue them once and for all. Uh, so he said, quote, it would be worth it because this will be the final war. And after that, we can sit and raise doves and all other beautiful birds that exist, end quote. Um, so thousands of Palestinians have died as a result of Israeli assaults on Gaza since this, the territory the gaza strip was put under siege in 2007 they've been under blockade since then and he uh he has said previously this was in december he told uh british media that the israelis have been too merciful towards the palestinians uh, he said, quote, anyone who wants to harm me, I will harm back. And as far as I'm concerned, the concept of proportionality must cease to exist. So I will tell you something that is very unpleasant to say. If it is one Israeli mother crying or a thousand Palestinian mothers crying, then a thousand Palestinian mothers will cry, end quote. So because he said that when he was asked about how in these flare ups in Gaza, you know, proportionally way more Palestinians are killed than Israelis. And there's usually a lot of civilians and children killed on the Palestinian side. So he, you know, and, and there's always been kind of these fringe extreme Israelis like this in the, in the, in the government. But now again, they, they have some power. 
Um, so we're just going to expect to see tensions really keep rising uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. And the and you know they might anger some of the Gulf countries enough that they might change their their tune about normalizing with Israel. Uh, but that's it for the news. Uh, go check out our viewpoints. We have a lot of good ones, as always. One from David Stockman titled Ukraine Was Not Built to Last. Um, go check that out. He's a great writer. One from Matthew er- Errett, uh, The High Cost of Blowing Up the World, Ukraine and the 2023 NDAA. So he goes over some of the more big things in the National Defense uh, Authorization Act for 2023. John Kuriaku. Uh, t- over at Consortium News, the CIA should get out of the laboratory. Um, calling, talking about how uh, CIA is involved in labs and and things like that for research that they should not be involved in anymore. And we have one from Daniel Larison uh, asking the question: What what if Ukraine had kept its nuclear weapons? Because we always hear this talking point that if Ukraine didn't give up its nuclear weapons, um, you know, this wouldn't be happening. So he explores that. Uh, But that is it. Oh, we have a good one from Ted Galen Carpenter. This is uh, at Responsible Statecraft titled China for some where restraint ends and hawkishness begins. And he gets into kind of the realists uh, and how they are so good on Ukraine and Russia, but then when you go over to Taiwan and China, you know, they they turn into hawks. Uh, So uh, go check that out. Uh, But that's it. That's everything for me for today. I'll be back tomorrow. You can go to antiwar.com slash donate to support us. Like and subscribe on YouTube, all that stuff that I always tell you to do. Um, But that's it. Uh, Thanks for listening for today's show, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.